Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. I invite you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10 this morning. Acts chapter 10. We're going to be looking and continuing on in Acts chapter 10 and looking at verses 17 through 33 this morning of Acts chapter 10. Several verses, but it's going to pull a lot of things together this morning. Acts chapter 10, verses 17 through 33. Well, first things first, I, uh, I didn't stop Rob during announcements, but... Uh, you know, tomorrow is a national holiday or uh, pretty much a nationwide holiday, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, but Tuesday is also a national holiday. It's called Easton Hannell's birthday. So uh, he turns four on Tuesday. So it's, it's a national holiday to me. I don't know if it is to everybody else. but And that's Bryson's actual birthday there too. Okay. All right. Well, uh, great things come all at once, don't they? Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I'm glad to see, I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. It's great to see a full house to worship God, I can tell you that. Now, um, this morning, there's another thing that I'm glad to see. Uh, I'm glad to see that nobody took me literally last Sunday morning, okay? Uh, I, I didn't have too much doubts, but last Sunday morning, you know, or last, yeah, last Sunday, I had said something about, you know, to Peter to, to eat the unclean meat, it was like, me telling you guys to come to church naked next Sunday. And um, I got some comments, some feedback from that. Uh, one of them come from our senior saints department. I won't say who it was, but on the way out the door, she said, you know some of them teenagers may take you literally on that. <laughs> and I don't see any teenagers here naked today, so I think we're all right on that. I know she was just kidding, but... Uh, and also, for, I want to apologize uh, for you who are in therapy now. Uh, thinking about Eric Kurgan dancing naked before the Lord, too. Uh, that, that's something that's still, I don't know why I brought it up now, it's haunting me again today. Yes. But anyway, uh, we're going to get into God's Word, and God's Word will wipe everything out, okay? That's, do you know this is the best therapy you can ever find? Uh, you know, you can go to all kinds of different counselors, and, and I, can, I can counsel people all day long. I do a lot of counseling in my line of profession, but... This is the only thing that I can stand on right here. If I try to go beyond this or outside of this, then uh, it, it goes outside of what God has intended for someone's life. You see, um, today we're going to talk again about kingdom vision. We're going to talk about kingdom vision, have been for the last three Sundays. The first Sunday we talked about clarity. Now remember Cornelius? Cornelius was a guy that he was close to God. He wasn't saved yet. Uh, but Cornelius, he was, he was seeking after God. Uh, Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was in charge of a hundred men, and, and he was praying and fasting about uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, and God came to him in a vision. Do you remember that? If you were here, remember, he came to, God came to him in a vision and told Cornelius to send some of his guys to Joppa to, to, to the house of Simon the Tanner, and he would find Simon Peter there. So that had transpired. And, and it was very clear what, what God was calling Cornelius to do. Vision is very clear. And, and then last week we talked about the movement of God. How also God was moving in Peter's life. Peter was praying to God and God opened up heavens and, and let this sheet down on, held by the four corners it said. And, and there was all these animals on top of it. And, and, and God told Peter, Peter was very hungry at the time physically... And God told Peter, he said, Peter, rise and kill and eat. Now, remember, that's where the illustration came in. That was as foreign as me saying, God said next Sunday we come in here naked. That's what I was making that point at. It was a foreign concept to Peter. He was a Jewish man who had nothing to do with anything unclean. In, in Leviticus, it talked about the unclean things that God said, stay away from. And so Peter never in his life, never since that moment in Jewish history, was it right for a Jewish believer to, to eat anything unclean. It was very ceremonial. It was like a ceremonial cleansing is what it was. But they took it to the extreme like they seemed to take everything too far. You see, God was trying to call his people out to separate from the world, not to be, they had to be in the world, but they couldn't be of the world. And that's the same thing God calls us to today. So, so God's kingdom vision brings clarity through Cornelius. It was clear 
and uh, uh, movement within Peter. It was moving Peter to, to think outside the box, to do something different than he'd ever done. A vision killer, remember, is this. Peter said, I'll never do that. That'll kill vision. When God gives a clear vision and we say, Lord, we've never done it that way before, that'll kill a vision quicker than anything. Because when God speaks, we're supposed to move. So today we're going to talk about not clarity, not movement, but alignment. Do you, know, do you know, God is good at lining things up when we pay attention to what he's doing. In fact, God has lined it up for you to be here today. Did you know that? You think that you got up because somebody invited you, because of somebody you like, somebody you know, because you're a member of the church, because you have to, because you just kind of wanted to, because you didn't have anything better to do. But God has lined it up so that you'll be here today and he wants to speak to you today. Now, I believe that here, here's, here's what we're going to look at, not just individualized, but the church. You see, I want you to think about this. What can happen when a church aligns with God's kingdom vision? What can happen when, when God has, has us in his sights and he lines us up and the kingdom vision is revealed and all of a sudden we know, God, you're doing something here. I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like what's going on at First Baptist Church right now. It's kind of what we're seeing happen right now. All the things that are happening, God is lining up for something big. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We're going to read the passage of Scripture, and we're going to kind of dive into kingdom vision and the alignment that God brings through kingdom vision. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look at them with me as I read it. It's several, several verses today, but it ties everything together. If you don't, it's going to be up on the screen. And think about the words, God's holy word, as I read it. Acts chapter 10, verse 17 says, Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for, made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision... The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he who you, who you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear the words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the following day, they entered uh, Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them. He had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or to go into one of, an, one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any, call any man un, or common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent to, for you, as I was sent for I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all things commanded you by God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today with thanksgiving in our hearts. I thank you, God, today for your word. And, and God, today, I just pray, help me to stand on your word. Help us to hear from you today through your word. Father, I pray today for the one who may know, need to know Jesus today. Lord, that you've aligned everything so that they can hear the gospel very clear today. That the movement within their life is not just a movement that, that, that is something that, that, that can not be explained, but it's you moving in their life. 
Father, I pray for salvation to come. Father, we pray today for uh, us as believers. Help us, God, as we expound upon your word today, God, that we would see very clearly and with the movement of the Holy Spirit today that you're lining things up, God, for ourselves, our lives, and our ch this church to do great things for your kingdom, God. Lord, you have a vision, a kingdom vision for this church, and I pray, God, that we would carry it out. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we're going to talk about kingdom vision and how God's kingdom vision brings alignment. God's kingdom vision and how it brings alignment. First of all, I believe that alignment is this, God's timing. You know God's timing means everything? God's timing is everything. Now, how many of you love when a plan comes together? How many of you love when you plan something and it all comes together? Think about this for a minute. I know back, you know, back in November, this guy turned 50 years old. Now, I know that's hard for you to believe, that, but it's true. I turned 50 years old back in November, and so my wife and my mom and several of you here decided that something big had to happen because, because I, I was turning 50. Now, I'm not the sharpest tack in the drawer, but I'm pretty good at discerning when something's going on around me. And I can honestly say they set it up on a Sunday night and everybody piled into the basement. Several of you were there. And we were up here for Bible study and Janine, she helped pull it off. She come up, she said, Don, we need you downstairs. A kid needs to talk to you. Well, that's natural for somebody who want to talk to me. And so I got up from the Bible study and I went downstairs and it wasn't until that exact moment that I realized that I'd been set up and it was a, a 50 or probably 75 people there to celebrate my birthday. You see, that happened, that event happened because it was timed out just right. It was the right time, the right place, and the right people came together. And so I was surprised and, and I appreciated all that and I appreciate all the efforts that went into that. Now, I can tell you this, there is a lot of effort that goes into people trying to line things up like birthday, surprise birthday parties and things going on. We even try to line things up in church, but I can tell you this, there is no substitute for God's timing when it comes to his vision. There, there is nothing greater than seeing things come together. Now, point in hand, remember we're talking about Cornelius and we're talking about Peter. We're talking about two different people in two different places and God's timing brought the right people at the right place at the right time to intersect in their life. Now, we, we look at that at face value, and we don't realize the significance of God's timing in this. In, in verse 17, remember, Cornelius had sent the men to, to, to the house, to, Peter's, or to Simon the Tanner's house, to look for Simon Peter, because God's vision told him to do that. Send these guys here to go find Simon Peter. At the very same time, God's timing, at the very same time, whenever Peter was on the rooftop... These men show up at, his, at the gate of Simon the Tanner, knocking on the gate, saying, we're here looking for Simon Peter. Now, I can tell you this. God's timing is the only way that we could explain something like that. There's no way that we could manufacture that. There's no way that we could accidentally make that happen. It's because God's timing wanted that thing to happen, that event, at that moment in time. Now, there's a key word in here, and we talk about it a lot. It's a, it's a King James word. But it, it's got a lot of depth and a lot of meaning. So if your translation is not King James or New King James, it may not have this word, but to me it's very significant. It says that Peter was wondering within himself what this vision which he had seen meant. So Peter's wondering, what in the world are you trying to tell me? This sheet coming down from heaven, all of a sudden I'm supposed to eat something I've been told for all my life not to eat, and all of a sudden the word pops out here, it's behold. The word behold pops out and it says, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry of Simon's house and stood before the gate. At that very moment in time, Peter needed to behold what was going on before him. Peter needed to understand exactly all the God things that were going on. It was God's timing. Now, now behold in the King James has a depth that, that, that we can't describe today. The word behold, whenever you see it in the Bible, basically means this. Stop and pay attention to what's going on around you. There's something God-sized happening around you. It's like this. Whenever Jesus came onto the scene, when Jesus was here in this world, 
And Jesus was about to begin his, his public ministry. And Jesus was going around teaching and healing and preaching the kingdom of God. And John the Baptist had risen. And he said, there's somebody coming before me that's going to be greater than I am. Everybody loved John the Baptist. Everybody looked to John the Baptist. They were being baptized, getting ready for, Je for Jesus to come. Not a baptism of repentance, but a baptism of, 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 of readiness for the Messiah to come. And so at that very moment, John the Baptist and Jesus intersected at a point in time. And when they did that, all the followers of John the Baptist, now John says, this is the very moment in time that I was born for. This is the very moment in time whenever Jesus himself, the Messiah, the Son of God, has come. And he said this, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, everything within John the Baptist was this. Stop looking at me and look at what's about to cross your path. Do you know that when Jesus tries to, to, to show us that he loves us, that God loves us, there are intersections in our life and God's saying, Behold, look what I'm doing. I'm moving in such a way that you can see exactly what's happening. People get so caught up in things. How many of you would say, that I am caught up in life right now. Is anybody willing to say that? Because there's times that even a preacher gets caught up in life. There's jobs to do, there's bills to pay, there's kids to raise, there's things to do. There's all these things going on, and all of a sudden we get so consumed by the world that we miss those behold moments, and we don't see God's timing in, in action. You see, God wants to intersect those, those things in our life, those people in our life, those ways in our life to show us, behold, I am real. Behold, I am here. Behold, my vision is this. I can tell you one such time here in First Baptist Church, and I thought of this as an example. I believe over the last five to ten years, because I've been pastor for ten years, I, I'm more aware of things now than I ever was before. But First Baptist Church has beheld many things that have happened of God. It was about five years ago, and, and here's what happened. This is, this is a modern-day translation and modern-day example of what happened when, when Peter and Cornelius intersected, and, and, and he said, Behold. You see, about five years ago now, we were at a crossroads, maybe four years ago, I guess, and we were deciding what to do. What is First Baptist Church going to do? Because we have to do something. We feel like God is speaking to us. There's something that God is trying to tell us, and we don't know what to do. And all of a sudden, everything began to align, and we decided that we needed to think about building a church, something bigger. Not, not, not building a church, building a building, because this is the church right here. And so, so what we did, we began to pray about it, and I'll never forget the night. It was a Wednesday night Bible study. We met up at the, the ground before we bought it. The place that we are at right now, building the new building, we had not purchased that property yet. We didn't know what to do, and we were. I, I thought, Lord, we've got to gather there. And we gathered on a Wednesday night, and there was a handful of you here on that Wednesday night. We went up there, and we gathered around, and I can tell you that that was a behold moment in my life. That was a moment when I prayed, and for the first time, more than ever, I knew that I knew that I knew that God was moving right there, and that was what we were supposed to do, that we were standing on holy ground at that very moment. That, that was a God moment for me, and that was a behold moment when God intersected our lives together and said, this is what you're supposed to do. I, it, it was very clear to me at that moment, that is exactly what's supposed to happen. And sure enough, as we began to, to say, okay, this is the vision that God's called, part of the vision of what God's called us to do, we began to pray about it, and so we go, and, and we're going to buy this piece of property. Now, some of you know this story, some of you don't, so I'm going to share with you, maybe some of you need to be reminded about it. We, had not enough, we did not have enough money to buy that piece of property. So we, we decided we're going to, to buy the property, borrow the money, and begin to pay off the property, and then we'll move forward after we get the property paid for. We had $45,000 in the bank. We were $30,000 short of, of carrying the vision forward with what God had for us. So we decided we were going to buy the piece of property, and I cannot... I cannot put into timing exactly how this happened, but it was a God thing. It was God's timing. At the very moment that we decided that this is what God wanted, and we were going to step forward with this, and we were trying to pay attention to the behold that God was putting in front of us, at that very moment, a man from Nebraska calls us 
and says, we, I've, we've got a house here in Pleasant Hill that belonged to my mom and dad, and we want to give it to the church. Now, at first, I'm thinking, oh, boy, what do we do with this? I mean, a house, you know, do we, do we want this house? Do we not want this house? And sure enough, behold, in the midst of all that, Jim Leeds calls. He actually came by my office. And Jim walks into my office, and he said, I, I, I don't know what's going on here, but we were getting ready to offer that guy an amount of money for that house. That, that hit, the one that him and Katsy live in right now, they're living in the very house. Behold, the very house that God intersected at that very moment in time. A man from Nebraska calls a church, gives it to someone. Somebody from within the church comes to me and says, Don, here's what we were going to offer the church or offer this man. And sure enough, guess what they were ready to offer? They were ready to offer the exact amount of money beforehand. You had no idea what we needed, right? And they offered the exact amount of money, and behold, at that very moment, God's vision intersected with our lives and this body of believers, and we purchased that property free and clear. I don't know if that means anything to you. Right now, you can say, behold, I see nothing. Behold, that was a coincidence. I can tell you this. There are millions of people out in this world that will go and open up a paper and look at a horoscope and base their future and their life on that. If you do that, shame on you. You need to put that down. You don't play around with that. That's not of God. If you go to a Chinese restaurant and you get a fortune cookie and you open it up, it's nice and cute to do that. There's nothing wrong with just opening it up. And you focus more on what's in the cookie than the cookie itself. Then behold, you're not focused on really what God wants. I've never seen anyone open up a fortune cookie and say, God just spoke to me. And if you think that God speaks to you through a fortune cookie, then I'll say, behold, you're a nut. I can tell you the truth. It's fun to play around with that. And they always word those fortune cookies to where you'll meet a tall, dark stranger in the future. Well, yeah, you're probably going to somewhere along the way. You know, you need to go out of this. I'm, I'm going to get some fortune cookies. This would be a good prank. You need to give all your money away to First Baptist Church. Uh, this ain't true. Can't be. You need to, you need to uh, spoil your preacher like never before. I don't see that in there. You see, we base so much of our life on, on, on happenstance. We base so much of our life on coincidence. And, and coincidence, I know some of you would argue, there is such thing as coincidence if you really understand what coincidence means. That means that two things coincide with each other. But we think of coincidence as, wow, how lucky was I that that happened? What a coincidence that that happened. And we think it's something out there, just, just luck, good fortune, fate, something happens, and we forget that there really isn't any coincidence in this world. It's God coinciding himself with us. That's exactly what was happening in this passage. God's timing is everything, folks. Next thing I want us to hear, God's task. God's timing is everything, but God ta God's task it is big. God's task is bigger than anything we can ever do. Individually, the task that God has for you for your life, you can never do God's task by yourself. Even as a church, as we come together, and over 100 people here coming together and filling all our resources and all the energy that we have, our time, our talents, our treasures, we can still never carry out God's task by ourselves. You see, we need to see the, the big picture. You see, God's vision is very complex. You cannot orchestrate God's timing. But God's, God's vision is, is, is huge. We, we don't understand the enormity of God's task. On the surface, here's what happened. Two men came together. Peter and Cornelius, two men, it doesn't say that they were world-renowned. It doesn't say anything. Now, Cornelius was a powerful man, but he wasn't, he wasn't, it wasn't like he was a king. And then you got Peter, you know, he's a disciple, and he was a fisherman, and God had called him into the ministry, and God had sent him to go out and preach the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, you got two men, and they, they just meet, and they collide together here in this passage. And so that... Let's call that on the surface. On the surface, here's what happens. We intersect, our, our, God intersects our lives with each other. 
And so we come together and we see things happening. I can tell you this. If someone is in your life and you think that God is speaking to you about that person, it is no coincidence. You're not here by accident. You're not here on coincidence. You're here because God wanted you here today. So on the surface, there's two men coming together, but we have to look at the big picture. Do you know a lot of times we don't behold the big picture? You see, the big picture is found in verse 28. It says, then he said to them, Simon Peter said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Folks, the size of what just happened there is much bigger than two men can ever imagine. The size of what God wants to do in this church and in your life and with each other is much bigger than you can ever imagine. You see, Peter being a Jew and Cornelius being a Gentile, that's this, they were were worlds apart. They were so far apart, they weren't even on each other's radar until God's timing brought them together. And as God's timing brought them together, they began to see the big picture. And in verse 28, it says that, Peter says, you know that my nation's not supposed to, supposed to uh, get along with your nation. We're not supposed to come into your house. We're not supposed to dine with you. We're not supposed to eat what you eat. We're not supposed to talk with you. In fact, if you look at the story of the Good Samaritan, we're supposed to walk around you and not even get close to you. And now all of a sudden, you don't see two men come together. You see what really God's doing. God's bringing two nations together. Only God can bring a nation together. Only God can reach the whole world at the same time. You see, the big picture at 30,000 feet is this. God is doing something much bigger than we can ever imagine. The big picture is that two nations became one. That Jesus died and he separated the wall of division between Jews and Gentiles. He was the chief cornerstone. At that very moment when Jesus died, when he shed his blood, when he had risen from the dead, Jesus said there's no longer any division. We're all one in God. And I can thank God for that today because without that, we may still be lost and without hope. But today because of that, we know that the big picture is God is bringing people together i got a modern-day illustration for that, too. Think about this. I don't know if all of you know this or not, but uh, Doug and Sandy Payne, they were up here for quite a while. They had to go back. I I look at this way. This is their home. They just go back for a visit down there, and they'll come back. The first time that God crossed Doug Payne and Don Handel's path was a long time ago now. Eight years ago, God crossed our path, and it wasn't here in this church. It wasn't at a prayer meeting. It wasn't while we were preaching the gospel. It was down at my tire shop. He came in. He had a flat tire. He came in and I fixed his tire. That sounds pretty simple on the surface. Two men, one from Mississippi and one from Illinois crossing paths. But I can tell you this. God had a much bigger picture for the future for us together and as as a church. Because through that, here's what happened. On the surface, that was one guy fixing another guy's tire. But we know the rest of the story. Now we are going internationally on mission trips because of that intersection in our life. You see, at that moment in time, we didn't know what God was doing, but we knew that God was doing something. And the next thing you know, First Baptist Church is filling out and fulfilling the Great Commission. The Great Commission is this, to go to the nations. That all nations are the same, that everybody needs Jesus. Yes, people need Jesus here at First Baptist Church in Pleasant Hill, in Pike County, in Illinois. But people need Jesus in Costa Rica. Why do I go down there? It's not because I want to. It's because God said that's what we're supposed to do. And I think there's several of you that can testify that once that happened, once we saw what was happening, got the big picture, many of you have said, you know, the moment this church began to explode is when we started going to Costa Rica. Some of you haven't seen that. Some of you still don't understand it. That's the big picture. God doesn't just want to save people here. He wants to save people across the world. Do you know I can say proudly that First Baptist Church has seen the vision and we've seen people saved all over the world? How awesome is it to see God's vision come to life in that way? Acts 1.8 says this, that we go to Jerusalem, we go to Judea, we go to Samaria, and we go to the ends of the earth. Folks, we're carrying that out at First Baptist Church. Why? Because God's timing and God's task have become evident. The last thing I want you to hear today, God's timing is everything. 
God's task is big, much bigger than we'll ever see. But God's target, here's the thing, God's target, you know what God's target is? It's people. God's target will always be people. So if we're doing anything at First Baptist Church, and I believe God has given us a clear vision, and we're moving forward with that vision, and we see things happening, we're reaching the nations, but if it ever comes about anything other than reaching people, then I believe that God may pull his power back from this church. Now, folks, you think I'm kidding. You think that that's not going to happen. I can tell you this. We've got to continue to go forward with what God's called us to do. Here's what it is. You know, when we go to Costa Rica, we come in on an airplane at about 30 or 35,000 feet. And when we go to Costa Rica, we, you know, a couple years ago when we went to Costa Rica, here's what happened. We had to wait in the air for 45 minutes and circle over Costa Rica. You know why? Some of you remember, President Obama had landed in Costa Rica. They shut down the whole airport. They kept anybody from going in, coming in or going out. And so for 45 minutes, we circled Costa Rica. I didn't go to Costa Rica to circle around it. I can tell you it's beautiful at 30,000 feet looking down at the mountains and all the rivers and streams and the ocean and all that stuff. That's awesome. We didn't go to Costa Rica for the sightseeing. We didn't go to, I've been accused of that. We didn't go to, Andy, we didn't even go to Costa Rica for all the beans and rice, did we? We went to Costa Rica because we were on the 30,000 foot tour. We went there because God called us to land the plane and to go and to speak to people. To speak to people about Jesus. There's a hunger there that I haven't seen anywhere else. They want to know the gospel. They're hungry for Jesus. Are you hungry for Jesus today? Do you want to see people's lives change? Let me me put it this way. Peter, in verse 29, he said this. He said, therefore I came without objection. Sometimes we go through God's vision kicking and screaming. Some of you kick and scream whenever you see what God's doing. I don't want to do this. I don't know why I'm doing this. It's something different. It's something odd. I don't know what it is. Peter went without objection. As soon as I was sent for. Why? Because he was clear that God was calling him to go to Cornelius' house. And then he asked this question, for what reason have you sent me? For what reason have you sent me? So the question becomes, why do people, why does God interact with people to call us to interact with God, to have a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, and to share that with others? That's a pretty clear vision when it comes to it. God has called us to be right with Him, and that comes through Jesus Christ, and only Jesus Christ. But God has called us to share that with others. For what reason did you send me to Cornelius' house. Why do you want me to be here? And Cornelius said this basically, I'm here because God said, you got something that I need to hear. You've got something that I need to hear. You see, God's kingdom vision is not at 30,000 feet. It's down at ground zero. Let me tell you this today. I believe that First Baptist Church is at ground zero right now. I believe that what God is doing in this church, what God is doing in our lives right now, is something that His timing, His task, and His target is real. Do you know that this world is a mess? Do you know that the only hope for this world, it's not found in the Koran. It's not found in the Book of Mormon. It's not found in any philosophy of life. It's found in God's Word. If it wasn't found in God's Word, I would not want to be here today. But I can tell you this truth. God is trying to intersect in your life in a way that He's never been before. For some of you here today, you're here and you know that you know that you know that God has you here for a reason. For what reason did you come today? Let's think of it from God's perspective. Let's take the plane at 30,000 feet while you think you're here and land it today. God has you here because he wants to speak to you in a way that you've never felt him before. 
You may be here today and you may know about Jesus. You may know of Jesus. You may have been in church. You may have tried to do the right thing, be a good person. But the Bible says that without Jesus, we're lost and we die and we go to hell. So today, as we come down to the ground zero, the target, God may have a target right on you today and he's hitting you right in the heart. Just like God sent Peter to speak to Cornelius and we're going to see how Peter preached Jesus to Cornelius Today, Jesus is being preached to you. And there's somebody here today that needs to accept Christ, and you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt, and you're going to have an opportunity here in just a moment to receive Christ. For some of us here today as believers in Christ, the vision that God has given us in our life, oh, you know, everything that's happened in this church, I'm glad it happened, and I'm excited about it happened somewhat. But you know what? We don't really see that God's timing. Behold, the intersection of our life that God is at this very moment is as real as it'll ever be. I I believe that this church is called to be a kingdom church with a kingdom vision. I believe this church is being called to go to the nations. I believe this church is being called not just to reach out to the world, but reach out to those around us and beside us every day. For some of us, We just need to spiritually wake up and see what God's doing. For some of you here today, you know God's laid something on your heart. You know what you need to do. I don't have any idea what you need to do today, but God knows. And he's saying, this is exactly what you need to do. You need to do it in your heart. You need to do it in your mind. You need to do it within yourself. And you need to lay it on the altar today. You see, God's vision is very clear. God's vision calls us to move. And God's vision aligns up His kingdom with us. Father God, we come to you this morning. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us, you've given us, Lord, a a clear call. Father God, I know today that there's people here today that need Christ in their life. Just as Cornelius, he was a good guy. He prayed. He gave alms. But he still needed Christ in his life. I'm so glad that you intersected Peter with Cornelius' life. It wasn't coincidence. It was a coinciding of a kingdom event. Today, there is a coinciding of a kingdom event. I don't know whose life it is right now, but somebody... Many people, whether it be for salvation, God, whether it be you simply saying, you need to get the big picture. Whether it be that we say as a church, as a body of believers, God, we just need to pray for this church body as we're reaching more and more people that we wouldn't lose sight of the vision you have for this church. Father, help us to respond. Help us to see that it's more than just about us. It's about your vision vision coming to life. Just as it did in Peter and Cornelius' life. It came to life. Everybody's seeing that Jesus, he's the answer. He's the gospel. He's the Savior. He needs to be Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying raising to new life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.